You clicked on this video because you're a little weird and you want some weird knowledge, so let's get right to it. We're going from least cursed to most cursed, so let's hop into a kiddie pool full of our first contender. Something I've learned recently is that a surprising number of people do not know what gelatin is made out of. If you are one of these people, I'm here to enlighten you. See, good old Mormon if is actually a compound that comes from collagen, and we get it by boiling the parts of the animal we don't eat. Such as the bones and hooves. If you ever pulled your mother's pork chop out of the fridge and had some clear gooey stuff on top, that is gelatin. Hopefully. I'm gonna throw in a jello shot of gelatin trivia to go with this. Gelatin has been used in cooking for hundreds of years in many horrifying ways. All the way from SpaghettiO jello in the 70s in the US, to holodets in Eastern Europe, all the way to a curry-based gelatin made in Northern Thailand that I couldn't find a proper pronunciation guide for, but I wanted to mention it. I believe it's called Gaangradong, question mark. The first patent for instant gelatin was made by a man named Peter Cooper, who also made the first steam engine in America and bold follicle choices. It gets weirder the more you look at it. This man's keratin formations are downright love Craftian. That said, gelatin isn't actually bad for you or anything. It's actually pretty nutritious as far as desserts go. It's actually full of stuff that helps your skin, your hair, and your joints. Eat enough gelatin and you too can have a lustrous coat like the golden retriever on the dog food bag. Next up, we're gonna be talking about slurping down some sweet, sweet red. So let's get ready. Next up, we're gonna talk about one of the most common food dyes in the world. It's called Carmine, AKA Cochineal, AKA Crimson Lake, AKA Red Natural 4, AKA E120, AKA Crush Up Cactus Bug. Carmine has been used by Native Americans for over a thousand years, and it's been used by the rest of the world since the 1500s. Carmine is used in a wide range of products. One of the most common uses for Carmine is in cosmetics. In fact, the bright red color that you associate with like early Hollywood, like Marilyn Monroe, that's Carmine. Nothing says glamor quite like a bit of bug goo on your lips. It's also been used in everything from clothes dyeing to painting, to a lot of your food. It's made by taking the cochineal scale insect, you crush it up into a powder, and you boil it in a base, like ammonia, and then you use alum to take the red out of the solution. Luckily, no one ever told Joseph McCarthy about alum. The interesting thing about all this is, as icky as it sounds, Carmine is actually one of the safer dyes we eat. After all, titanium dioxide, red 40, yellow 6, and yellow 5 are all commonly used, but known to be linked to several health conditions. On the other hand, the main health concern for Carmine is that some people are allergic to it, and new synthesized versions of it seem to get rid of that issue. That makes it a downright health food compared to brominated vegetable oil, which was found in Mountain Dew till recently. It can cause severe memory loss and other brain damage, but if you still want that since it's been taken out, you can just buy Mountain Dew Throwback, which still has it in it. So next time you're walking past a cactus and see some weird white shit on it, maybe thank it for not being as bad for you as a lot of the other things you eat. Next up, we're gonna talk about some hidden protein that might have been helping out your macros. We're about to talk about the fun and exciting world of allowable contamination in your food. See, an inescapable truth about the food we eat is that it comes from outside. That means that it comes in contact with other things that are outside. And oftentimes those things are still contacting it when it's in your mouth. See, the FDA has a whole set of rules called food defect action levels. This is a whole list of very specific amounts of insects and other contaminants are allowed in your food in the US. Some examples are up to 925 insect fragments per 10 grams of thyme. Or you can have 20 whole insects in a 100 pound bag of peanuts. Or my favorite, you can have 2,500 aphids in 10 grams of hops. The idea behind these rules is that when you're operating a scale, it's hard to keep all the little bugs out. It's kind of like how at large gatherings, like sports venues or conventions, it's hard to keep out undesirable people like people who play World of Warcraft. Also, I see my EU frog sitting there giggling, but I have some news for you as well. See, the EU does not have a table like this. They don't have an equivalent. But that doesn't mean what people think it means. Not having a limit does not mean the same thing as none of it is allowed. I've even seen some English news agencies get this wrong, so let's go through what that actually means. The way EU law is written is that the bug parts do not have a set limit. What it goes down to is whether or not the inspector thinks it's hygienic. The fact that this is left up to interpretation is slightly worrying, even though EU generally has better food safety than the US. There might be some internal guidelines that I don't have access to, but as far as the law goes, it's really just up to whoever the inspector is that day. This means that it's entirely possible that there are factories in the EU that are being regulated much harsher than the US, but there are others that might be more lenient, which is kind of odd. The good news is you've been eating it your whole life and you're still here. Next up, we're gonna talk about Chuck Berry's favorite subject. This next subject is just kind of a basic truth of our lives. Everything you eat and everything you own has been urinated on at some point. You may be wondering who has urinated on my things, and the answer is me and my crew. See, pretty much everything that you interact with on a daily basis has at some point been in a warehouse. And due to the nature of warehouses, they often have their doors open and they're usually in less populated parts of town. That means that it doesn't really matter how much pest control these warehouses try to do, there's a good chance at any given moment there's gonna be some sort of pest in it. Could be rats, could be mice, could be cockroaches, could be just about anything, honestly. The rats yearn for the warehouse, much like the children yearn for the mines. I actually used to have a coworker who worked at a Coca-Cola factory 
and he talked about that he always put his cans in the dishwasher before drinking out of them because of what he'd seen. Again, this is something totally out of your control. You can do nothing about it. You didn't even know about it till just now, but it hasn't done anything to you. So maybe just think about cleaning off your cans and go on with your day. Our next subject's a little bit more saucy. This next part is more of a historical piece of food fuckery. A1 sauce was created in 1831, Tabasco in 1868, Heinz ketchup in 1869, HP sauce in 1895, Marmite in 1902, and French's mustard in 1903. You may be thinking, okay, so? See, the mid to late 1800s saw an explosion in the creation of condiments in the West for a very specific reason. The reason is that in this time period, urbanization became much more prevalent in Western countries. And at the same time, their logistics had not upgraded to have, you know, cars or refrigeration. This led to the sad reality that many people living in that time period in cities were eating rotten food. A lot of people living then turned to fish sauce and soy sauce that they got from Asian immigrants to cover the taste of their rotten food. Side note here, I do think that Asia probably was ahead of the game on condiments due to the fact that they had much more stable civilizations and probably encountered some of these issues earlier. In this time period, a lot of new sauces were being created. Jane Austen really liked walnut ketchup. There's also banana ketchup and mushroom ketchup, which are still somewhat common. When you really think about that time period and think about what the food conditions were probably like, it is pretty bleak and you understand why it would be like this. If you wanted some meat for dinner that night, you went down to the dirt road that was full of horse crap, and you went to the little stall, and they had some meat that had been hanging there for a couple days. The flies had gotten to it, and it's just disgusting. It's been out in the heat in like Philadelphia in July. It would almost be as disgusting as Burger King's fries. It also makes sense why everyone was eating soup back then, because you could season it up and boil it, and then you wouldn't notice the bad taste or texture. So even though I've given you a whole bunch of reasons in this video why our food today is a little gross, at least be happy that you're eating better than Charles Dickens was.